Welcome everybody to a new Innovators Update. My name is Richard, uh, co-founder of Revolver.com. We are back with Rachel Gordon, the communication manager at MIT CSAIL. Um, she brought a guest from the lab who is teaching robots how to be curious. Welcome, Rach. Can you introduce our new guest? Hey Rich, thanks for having me as always. Today our guest is a PhD student from MIT CSAIL, Karis Moses, and she's working on the intersection of robotics and artificial intelligence. And today she's gonna to tell us about her research on how she's teaching robots to be more active learners. Karis, welcome. Thank you, it's great to be here. So Karis, we have curiosity, very basic instinct for humans, super easy. We're all curious, we wanna learn more about the world. Why is this so hard for robots? Yeah, so first let me start with a little bit of background about my project. Um, so I work in the space of active learning and sometimes we also refer to it as curiosity. And this is really rooted in the need for robots to have accurate models of how the world works. So a model is really anything that describes how a world works, how a robot can impact its surroundings with its actions. And as humans, we have really good models and we develop these just over time by growing up you know, in this world and interacting with things as children um, and building up these models to the point where we kind of take for granted how complex these models really are. And so in our work, we were interested in leveraging this similar kind of learning in robotics. And so this is challenging because as you can imagine, there are thousands, like uncountable amounts of actions a robot can take in the world and just randomly taking actions um, would take a prohibitively long time to learn these accurate models. And so what we wanna do is leverage active learning, which is a way to be very uh, selective in the kinds of data that the robot collects in order to learn these models. So with that background, um, you know, we are, we are using curious exploration to learn accurate models of how the world works. And we test this out in a tower stacking domain so the robot is given a set of blocks. It knows the dimensions of the blocks. It knows the center of mass of the blocks. And we're just saying, okay, stack these blocks into a stable tower. And it has to understand what that underlying stability function is given these block properties. And so what the uh, exact thing we're trying to learn is something called a planned feasibility model. So given a tower, so the placement of specific blocks in a specific arrangement, Will this tower be stable or not? Um, and that's what we use this curious exploration to kind of guide. The robot's gonna say, oh, I think this tower might be stable, but I'm not sure, so let me build it and see what happens. And we do that over and over again until the robot has built up this understanding of plan feasibility or stability in this tower stacking case. Cool. Hey, and um, with this tower task, Garris, uh, how is the robot understanding its spatial surroundings? Yeah, so um, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with all of the amazing computer vision work going on right now. We can go from images to poses of objects, which are their positions in the 3D space. Um, we can also go from images to segmented images that indicate you know, where each object is in a scene. Um, however, that was not the main focus of our work. So we use a bit of a more engineered system in our work. So uh, if you have seen any images of this curiosity project, you'll see these little tags on all of the blocks and those are called AR tags. And they're used to identify the position of a block within an image. And so we have two global cameras set up that can see all of the blocks and the robot. And that gives the robot an idea of kind of the global positioning of these blocks in the world. However, there's still some amount of error in that vision system, especially when the blocks are further away um, you can imagine the tags take up kind of a smaller view in the image, so there's some ambiguity about where exactly they are. And so in our system, the robot moves to the global position of the block, and then it has actually a third camera mounted on its wrist. So once it can see the object it's trying to pick up, it does a little adjustment at the end and then goes and grasps the block. Um, so that's kind of how it keeps track of where all the objects are in the world. And this information is then used to calculate stability. So once it builds a tower, it looks at the scene and it says, is that block that I just tried to place where I tried to place it? And if it is, then that means that the tower is stable. And if it's not, that means that the tower fell. 
And we then use that global camera system to relocate the blocks and then clean up its mess essentially. So put all the blocks back in their home positions. Right. And that's so interesting because, you know, with a toddler, they'll have a physical feeling if they drop a block and it hits them or, you know, they'll be constantly kind of reinforced by physical sensations and whatnot. So there are so many other senses that they can rely on. And, you know, I've just read so much about how we're really trying to kind of replicate that with soft robotics. So I'm just also wondering if that's something that you'll be kind of maybe employing with your project or looking at in the future to have, you know, some more tactile sensations there. Yeah, that's a great question. There's definitely a lot of work in the space of soft robotics. Something called gel site is being used by a lot of labs to try to localize objects within the hands of robots. Um, and sensor fusion is another big space where exactly like you said, we have visual data, but then there are also all these other senses that robots could be leveraging. And how do we effectively fuse all of that information together to um, you know, understand the scene or the current state of the world? Um, that's not something that I'm looking into personally, but definitely an interesting approach to these kinds of problems. Right. And just kind of a follow up here. So for your model, it collected data autonomously for about 55 hours, which in this space seems like a lot of time. But if you think about a toddler, they're learning all of this information over years. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so we kind of set up what I would call a semi-structured environment to demonstrate this research topic. So um, the goal of our lab really is to have robots operating in completely unstructured environments. Um, you can imagine a structured environment is one in which the robot knows where everything is and exactly what it needs to do. So think like a warehouse or rather like a manufacturing plant where a robot is just you know picking up the same part and putting it in the same place over and over again. That's a very structured environment. But what we're trying to do is develop robots that can just be put in a new place and have the tools to figure out kind of what it needs to understand in order to achieve some goal. Um, and so to kind of as a stepping stone in that direction, a lot of our work involves setting up these sort of semi-structured environments where the robot is given a certain amount of information. So in our case, you know, the block properties, but something is missing in our case, the stability function. Um, and it just needs to demonstrate that it can learn this function in kind of a data efficient and effective way. Um, because exactly like you said, the case of a child operating in, you know, a completely random environment um, is very challenging to tackle. As I said earlier, you know, this space of states that the world could be in or the space of actions that the robot or child could take is just infinite. Um, so we need ways to kind of take like bite-sized chunks out of these problems and tackle them um, one at a time. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and Karis, uh, I mean, when you're talking and explaining your research, like uh, your mind slowly wanders off to like what kind of like um, uh, applications this technology could have in the future, right? Um, you know, is this uh, for improving like assistive technologies? Uh, is it more for space exploration or are there even more specific use cases for what you're doing? Yeah, so I'd say the, the end use cases are, are huge. Um, in this work specifically, you know, the goal wasn't to build the best tower stacking robot in the world. It was really just kind of a platform to show this scenario in this semi-structured environment, as I said. Um, but the real goal of our lab is really to just deploy robots into unstructured environments. So that could be like in a household application, it could definitely be in assistive technologies. Um, it could also be in kind of disaster relief. That's been a big focus, especially after like the DARPA Grand Challenge. Um, that's a super unstructured environment, right? Like the robot really doesn't know, is this thing I'm about to step on stable? Is, you know, can I pick this up without causing more things to fall? Um, so really the goal is just any sort of unstructured environment. Unfortunately, I do think this is a bit far away, um, but that is the end goal. So, I mean, the fact that we don't even really have fully autonomous self-driving cars yet, I think just shows how challenging these problems are. Even in the self-driving car case, like roadways are um, a bit more structured in some ways than, you know, other domains. There's, you know, there should be lines on the road, 
there's a speed limit, like the robot has some bounds it needs to operate in. Um, but even that, you know, there's still going to be the little, you know, coastal town that has no signs and these really challenging problems. And that's kind of what we're trying to address in this work. Now, I know that this research definitely will be, you know, played out over many years because it's so nuanced. So what's kind of the next incremental step that you want to make to see some kind of progress in this project? Yeah, so there are kind of um, two directions that I'm interested in. Um, and I also just want to say I did not work on this alone at all. I had a huge team of other grad students and um, a research scientist, and we worked completely together in everything. Um, so we're interested in, um, in one case, we're interested in giving the robot a bit less information. So as I said, it's about kind of like creating stepping stones between um, semi-structured and fully unstructured. So one push in this direction towards unstructured would be not giving the robot the object properties. So maybe it doesn't know the center of mass and it has to both learn the object center of mass as well as the stability function. Um, and so in that case, you know, the, the parameters that it would learn that correspond to these blocks may not be interpretable. You may not be able to look at them and say, oh, this is, you know, the center of mass, but the robot will learn some representation that enables it to make predictions about the stability of the tower. Um, so that's a direction we're interested in. Um, another one that I'm interested in is how to handle kind of more varied and complex tasks. So ones with a wider set of actions, you know, here the robot could only really like stack a block. Um, but I'd like to kind of push in the direction of more complex tasks in a way where maybe the robot is trying to kind of anticipate what kind of tasks it may be asked to do. So, um, you know, if a robot is in a household, say, and, you know, the household keeper is always saying, like, um, put the laundry away, you know, in this specific wardrobe, maybe you could say, oh, I see, like, there's another wardrobe over here that looks a little bit different. Maybe they're going to ask me to do this task in the future, so I should just start figuring this out now. Um, so that when I am asked in the future, it won't take me, you know, 55 hours or much more than that probably to learn this task. So can we anticipate the kind of goal distribution that the robot might see? Um, yeah, so those are two, just two. There's so many directions this work could go, but those are two we're looking into. Cool. Uh, well, thanks for sharing, Karis. Um, yeah, uh, many uh, exciting opportunities, uh, I assume, assume for you and, uh, and and your team to work on, uh, especially looking at uh, what's happening in uh, in robotics uh, over the past few years. Um, for for now, this is the this is all the time that uh, that we had uh, that we have. Uh, I want to thank you both uh, uh, so much uh, for your time. Um, I hope we get to catch up in the future uh, to see how things uh, are progressing. Um, I assume. Um, Rachel and Karis, you will also keep sharing your research and updates, um, uh, which we can then, of course, uh, share with our community as well. Um, so again, thanks. Uh, for our uh, viewers, um, they can, of course, watch this interview on our website, revolve.com, uh, but they can also listen to it on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Uh, you just need to search for uh, Innovators Update. Um, and from my end, that's it. Uh, thanks again, uh, Karis. Thanks, uh, Rachel. Um, and I look forward to, uh, to our next call.